Well, happy Sabbath. We are ecstatic that you have the possibility of joining us as we open Scripture and we delve into the Word. Today we continue our study on the covenant, and we're going to focus on this idea, this sign of the covenant, a sign that appears throughout uh, the Torah and is embodied in this beautiful doctrine that we like to call the notion of Sabbath. Now, before we jump into our conversation, it is right and proper for us to pray and to invite God to come into the space. Let us pray. Jesus, we want to thank you. Just thank you for your capacity to connect with us. And as we talk about the Sabbath, as we think about what it means to be your people, and we reflect upon the notion of this temple in time, we simply pray that you open our hearts, and that you give understanding to our mind so that we will be able to extract some truths that can help us on our faith walk with you. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Now, it was only a couple of weeks ago that we celebrated a birthday at my house, and everyone came around. It was a birthday that was supposed to celebrate a new member that has just joined our family. And my son was very excited about the prospect of having his favorite food of them all. I am, of course, talking about cake. And so as we thought and debated about what cake we like the best, we landed on a beautiful raspberry cheesecake from this masterful creator, a place that is a locale where diets go to die nothing but cakes. And as we ordered the beautiful cake and we began to think about how to cut it, I saw my son, greed filling his eyes and saliva coming down his mouth as he looked at each one of those scrumptious slices. And then he saw it. You know, he saw the biggest one. And he began to angle his body so that it would land and it would move in front of this slice that was larger than the rest. And at that moment, I had a vision. I had a vision of what all that is wrong with our culture. You know, the society that you and I inhabit, consumerism is defined as this need to accumulate resources because in the end, as we've said before, resources are viewed as finite. And so this puts us in a Darwinian competition with each other, a need to satiate this fear that what we have or what we're competing for is going to run out. And so the question that is always asked in the framework of a consumeristic society is, how can we do things more efficiently? How can we improve productivity? How can we get better at doing these tasks faster? We learn to invest our time and to allocate our time in ways that will make us more productive. And sadly, when you begin to think about how we attempt to defend the doctrine of Sabbath, we use these same terms. And we talk about studies that have been done around the world that look at productivity. Studies that have determined that after six days of working straight, your, your productivity nosedives. And so the idea then of Sabbath is a mere interlude in our work week a way in which we recharge our batteries to get back to the main task. And what is our main task? To be more efficient and to produce more. Well, I'd like to put it to you that the purpose of Sabbath is not to prepare us for work, but rather the purpose of Sabbath is to give meaning 
to our work. God says, six days you shall work and do all your labor. But the labor means nothing if it is not accompanied by rest. You don't have Sabbath so that you can work better. You work because you are expecting, as the Jews say, the bride of Yahweh, the Sabbath. And that is why if you have a chance at any point in your life to go to the Holy Land, you will see. You will see that Friday night people gather around a table and light candles, sing songs, and celebrate the arrival of the crowning jewel of the week, the bride of God, the Sabbath. I love the way Abraham Joshua Heschel puts it in his book, The Sabbath. Listen to what Heschel writes. He says, Sabbath, Sabbath is where we learn the art of surpassing civilization. See, when you look around the world, you think that the great buildings we build, the technology we developed, the systems we've created, that is what matters. That is what gives life meaning. Sabbath forces you to grapple with the reality that what gives meaning to your life is not what you have built, but rather the relationships that you have engendered. And so you have the notion of Sabbath. The idea that, as Heschel again reminds us in that wonderful book, human beings are not beasts of burden. We are not meant simply to work. We are meant to know and to be known. Now think about this idea of Sabbath in the context of Scripture. We're going to go two places today, and two places that you know really well and that we've discussed at some length in our previous conversations. As we've been doing this whole trimester, we're going to start in the book of Exodus. We're going to start by simply talking about the Ten Commandments. I bet most of you could recite that pericope that is found in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 10. Remember the Sabbath day. Remember to keep it holy six days. You shall labor and do all your work. But of the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do no work, neither you nor your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, your animals, nor nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord Yahweh made the Sabbath holy. We've talked about how Sabbath is the connection between our duties to God and our duties to each other. We've talked about how our duties to God and our covenantal relationship with Yahweh is lived out and enfleshed in the exchanges that we share with each other. But today I'd like to propose to you that Sabbath gives us a glimpse, eh, just the briefest of glimpse, of what God truly values. And think about what's most important to you. The beginning of the month, you begin to enumerate your expenses. You tally the hours worked and you multiply those by your hourly wage. You have to factor in taxes. And then you begin to say, I need this much for my living expenses, this much to put away for the future. You divide. And you place a hierarchy, a priority on things, things that you can either buy or sell. Chances are, chances are that as you're doing this, you are part of a cohort, a cadre of people that are doing exactly the same calculations in your same income bracket. And chances are that you seldom stray from that particular group. You know, we relate to people, after all, that have the same earning capacity and potential that we do. Very often do we transpollinate between social strata. But you know what? I see it. I see it happen still in one place. In our church, Loma Linda University Church, every Sabbath, 
We see people move through this ex through these extemporaneous and sometimes porous borders that we have created and enjoy community with people with whom they have nothing in common. You see physicians interact with people that work as janitors in a medical center. You will see professors engage with people who had to drop out of high school. You see powerful CEOs exchange conversations and sometimes even meals with senior citizens who live on a fixed income. Because what God prioritizes isn't our earning potential, how many letters are after our name, our titles, or our educational level. What God prioritizes is people. And Sabbath allows you to truly see people. People devoid of all these other classifications that we use to separate them. And that's why Sabbath is so meaningful. Because it gives you a glimpse not only of what God values, but of who we will be when God comes back to claim us. On it, you shall do no work. Now, during the week, it's important. And what you do matters. The cars you drive, the houses you live in, how much is in your 401k, those things matter to us. But they're fleeting. They're fleeting compared to the people that inhabit those stories. You know, there is no gated community after all in the New Jerusalem. And so God will tell us, remember the Sabbath day. Now, what would it be as a covenant people if we began to recognize that our main task, our calling, our duty is not to create borders, but instead to redraw lines, to redraw the lines that make up for our social circles. Isn't that, after all, what God is doing? Isn't that, after all, what God has done with Israel from the beginning? Isn't that the purpose of covenant? Isn't covenant merely a redrawing of the borders that would separate human beings from God? A connection, a bridge between Sinai and heaven? A way in which we can interact and link up with God? Of course, Sabbath has been there from the beginning, not because it is a mark of who the remnant is intended to give you some sense of superiority in this ultimate conflict that is going to shake the cosmos, though I'm not against that narrative. But that's not the primary purpose of Sabbath. Sabbath, after all, is simply the redrawing of lines. The moment where Adam and Eve recognize that they are not alone in the garden, that there is a, a God who will walk amidst that garden in the coolness and the breeze of the evening. It is Sabbath that will allow Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to claim an identity in the middle of the desert. It is Sabbath that will give Israel some solace as they are crafting and constructing pyramids and structures, erecting edifices for Pharaoh. It is Sabbath. Well, they were marvel uh, about the mercy of God as he provides manna from heaven. It is Sabbath where they will be able to remember God's providential care as they inhabit a new temple. And Sabbath, Sabbath will be the one thing that holds them together in exile. Sabbath will be what allows the bitter reality of the temple destruction to be more manageable. Sabbath, Sabbath is the place where those Dusty fingernails and worn out hands touch the sick and the blind and allow lepers to be whole and lame people to leap in front of pools as the master says, walk. It is Sabbath 
Sabbath that inspires the revelator to dream about a vision in a wonderful trek to the heavenly sea. It is Sabbath. Sabbath for the purpose of relationship and the redrawing of lines. That's what it really is to be covenant people. Again, Heschel, in his book, Sabbath will, re, will say these wondrous words that ought to construct dreams about the world to come. He says, unless we are able to learn to relish the taste of Sabbath, we will be unable to enjoy the taste of eternity in the world to come. How I wish the younger me, desperate for my parents to wake up from their Sabbath nap, would have learned this lesson. That I'm supposed to enjoy and savor every second of Sabbath because it is a snapshot of what heaven's going to be like. Maybe that's what inspires Isaiah to write his passage and his vision of Sabbath. You know the text, Isaiah 58, chapter 13, verse 13. It says, if you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way and not speaking as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride and triumph on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father's Jacob, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. How do I refrain from doing my delight on the Lord's holy day? How do I keep myself and my feet from breaking the Sabbath? Well, the easy answer is I follow a list. But I think I think a covenantal de- relationship demands that we refrain from breaking Sabbath and that we delight in the day by redrawing our borders, by recasting our lines, by opening up our circle, and by getting just the briefest of glimpses of what heaven's going to be. So today you have a choice to make. You can continue to believe that Fleeting time is a resource for which you must compete. And that God is merely a piece of the puzzle to which you need to allocate a day during the week. Or you can choose to believe that the God we serve showers us with unending grace. And that the banks of heaven will never be empty. So we no longer need to compete for resources, for time. We no longer need to allocate or worry. We need to rejoice and draw lines that ever grow bigger. So happy Sabbath. Enjoy a glimpse of what heaven's going to be like. Joey, how are you on this Sabbath? I'm doing good. Uh you know, Sabbath is something that I have learned to appreciate as I've grown in my faith in Jesus. I've, as I've grown in my relationship with him, Sabbath has become something that has become more and more treasured to me. But it was a growing experience, yeah. right? It, it wasn't like that initially. Yeah, it wasn't. That is the truth. <laughs> yeah. Especially when we're little, right? So, so Joey, I know for me, it was it was this, this really difficult uh, just relationship with the Sabbath because I loved the food. I loved the fact that there was a dessert. I love the fact that a lot of planning went into the meal. Yeah. But then it was it was kind of count, counting down the minutes and the seconds until the sun would go down yeah. so that we could go back to living life. And as a pastor now, I know for us, enjoy as we might watching our friends come to church it's a really busy day for us. Mm-hmm. So just personally, how do you make this day special? How do you, as a member of this covenant people, make Sabbath a sign of covenant? Yeah. I, I love what you were talking about, how 
and and what the lesson talked about how the the sign was never supposed to be just about works like the sign itself is is a sign of grace right mm-hmm. and i think about the israelites and them coming out of slavery and how much of a gift this was for them like they didn't read it and say oh you can't work and they're like oh no we really <laughs> want to work and and now god is forcing us to stop work that wasn't it for them right. for them they had to work all the time they were slaves and now god is saying you know what I'm going to create this space, this space that I created at creation. I'm going to remind you of this so that you know that you are not, like you said, beasts of burden, mm-hmm. right? You're not beasts of burden, that your whole purpose in life is not just to produce things, but actually it's a gift that that you are reminded of what life is truly about, yeah. that it's about relationships like yeah. you were talking no, about. No, that is, oh, Joey, that is such a good point. Um so Walter Brugman, who we had in our in our congregation a few a uh, few years ago, and I just completely had a a complete geek moment because Brugman is one of the authors I read the most. Uh, was presenting on his new book at that time, "The Sabbath as a Sign of Resistance," mm. and he really shifts the paradigm a bit. So we thought, or at least I grew up thinking, that. Sabbath was this interlude in my life, mm. just gear up for working. Yeah. And what Brueggemann was saying was, no, no, no. Your whole life, your week, those six days only have meaning because mm. of Sabbath. And so the whole of existence isn't geared to what you do on Sunday through Friday. Mm. Rather, it is what you do on the seventh day. That mm. is kind of, and everything else is an outflow of that. Yeah. I don't know if I can do that though, because when I'm th- when I'm when I'm even now with with this new understanding of as you're saying the Sabbath as a sign of grace, I'm constantly thinking about. Stuff that needs to get done at home Mm -hmm. or taking my kids to school or the bills that need to get paid. I'm wondering how in practice, since I know that you are a practical man, how do we reframe that paradigm? Wow. You know, actually, before I answer that, there's a story popped into my mind as you were talking. Uh, my wife and I went whale watching once in Newport. We went on this boat, tried to f- see whales. We didn't see a single whale. So, <laughs> and, and they tell us that we were ju- we just had bad luck, and they gave us a coupon to come back, but we never went back. <laughs> but while we were on there on the boat, just cruising the bay without seeing any whales, um, we got talking to this um, to two gentlemen from Germany who were here on business, and they were just taking a break. And they asked us what we did, and you know, my wife shared that she was a uh, um, licensed marriage and family therapist. And um, they asked her, you know, what she did, how, how, how she, um, what, what kind of work she would really engage in. And she kind of summarized it as, you know, I help people to become uh, productive members of society again. And they just laughed and they said, that is the most American thing to say, mm. right? To that, that the goal is to get people to be productive members of society again. And that is woven into mm-hmm. our the fabric of America, right? This whole Puritan uh, work ethic and all of that, 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 w- that what we do and ha- what we produce, it actually creates our value, mm-hmm. right? And the beauty of the Sabbath is what, like you said, we are not be burden. We were not created to produce. We are created to be in relationship, mm-hmm. relationship with God and relationships with people. And that's what Sabbath is about. So I think when, when we answer this question about what is, how do we, how do we engage in Sabbath in a way that does that? I mean, part of it has to be that we're in relationships, yeah. right? That the, at least for that day, the priority is relationships. Mm. And one small way that I try to do that, which I'm not always successful at because it is attached to my life and attached to my hip and attached to my hand, is try to take a step back from the digital, take a step back from the cell phone. Because a lot of times that thing that was supposed to be a connection point between people actually tends to get in the way of my relationships with people. I mean, I hear about how now it's it's kids that are crying out that they've lost their parents mm-hmm. to to cell phones, right? That they want the eye contact, they want they want uh, I, what was that phrase that I heard? 
listen to me with your eyes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, that they want that kind of interaction and yet the, the cell phone gets in the way. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't use cell phones at all during the Sabbath. That's not what I'm saying. But I do think that there needs to be some way that we prioritize relationships. And I think really a lot of times those in-person relationships um, during during the Sabbath and not other things. That that, mm -hmm. at least for the Sabbath, that becomes primary. Oh, wow. How that... about you? Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to picture um, Sarah and you on a, on a boat in Newport whale watching and just frustrated because you've seen <laughs> a whale. And then some Europeans come. And as all, as all Europeans do, they just, they just talk trash about Americans. <laughs> it's true. But it's so true that just our cultures are so different. I know that, uh, like me, you went to Greece to do uh, studies in biblical languages. And I'll tell you, well, the hardest thing for me wasn't the jet lag. Mm. It was the fact that we would get out of class at noon for our noon break. And we wanted to go out and explore. Mm -hmm. And everything was closed. And we had to be back in the afternoon for classes. And so we were wondering, where is everyone? And everybody was just napping. <laughs> and so, so Europeans take like this break in the middle of their week, of their work day. It looks like a three hour break to eat and to nap. And just that shift, re recognizing that the most important thing of their uh, in their day isn't their job. Mm -hmm. Rather, it's the meal they have it was really life altering. I'm, I'm starting to think that there might be something to that in connection with this invitation to prioritize relationships, because a lot of things happen mm -hmm. at a at a meal table. Um, we're reading uh, in our in our staff here at church, this book by Jay Kim, mm -hmm. right, which um, and one of the at the end of the book, he's talking about this idea of the communal meal yeah. and how central that was to the early Christian church, because there is so much that happens. Not only are you able to kind of break down the barriers that that prevent conversation, but as you're saying, you're able to read all these nonverbal cues that exist in conversation. Mm -hmm. And so if we are prioritizing relationships, then then it probably would behoove us to begin to open some intentional spaces yeah. for these conversations and these and these relationships to flourish. And uh, maybe it's just because I like to eat, but what better way than doing that at a at a Sabbath meal, uh, which I know um, our Jewish brethren have been doing for five thousand years. Yeah, and you know we both grew up in ethnic churches and. Um, in a lot of ethnic churches, the, the potluck is almost as important mm -hmm. as, as the worship service, mm -hmm. right? And I used to sometimes cringe at that thought, but as I read scripture and I read what the early church mm -hmm. was like, that communal meal, that, that wasn't just like the communion that we do now with little tiny pieces mm -hmm. of bread. It, it wasn't like that. It was a feast. It was, it was a time for people to be together in community. And I think we're seeing more and more that that relationships are really built over meals. Mm -hmm. I mean, even in the business world, they realize that, right? That that's why they do a business lunch. Mm -hmm. It's because when you're eating together, it's so much easier to actually connect to one another. And it creates an environment where it's not just work, it's relationship mm -hmm. that's built. And relationship is key to business. And it's key, what scripture do, seems to be saying is it's key to life. Yeah, no, yeah. that's that's well said. So if, if Sabbath is about building relationships, isn't it also then an invitation to go out and seek relationships mm. with people with whom we, we don't naturally connect? Yes. So I have relationships uh, that are rather easy with people that think like me, mm -hmm. that have the same educational level as I do, that have the same income and earning potential as I do that have the same basic interests that I do. It's really easy to form relationships with those people. What about the people that I don't have that much in common with? Is not then Sabbath an invitation to be intentional, not only about connecting, but about who we're connecting with? 
Yeah. I mean, they talk about relationships that the key factors to determine whether someone will become your friend is if they are like us and they are near us, right? Mm -hmm. They call it the narcissistic principle and the lazy principle. <laughs> so those people who are closest in proximity and also closest in in character or cr closest in lifestyle as, as we are, those are the people we generally become mm -hmm. friends with. And yet what we see in scripture, and this is what J. Kim in, in the book that we're reading as a staff talks about, that church is the one place where we're supposed to connect with people who are unlike mm -hmm. us. And you look at the communities of God followers throughout scripture, and especially in Jesus' disciples, you see people who are from all strata, who are from all backgrounds. I mean, you have a zealot who's a disciple who hates um, uh, Jewish collaborators, people who work with Romans. And then you have Matthew, who is a tax collector, mm -hmm. whose whole job was to collaborate mm -hmm. with the Romans. I mean, just can you imagine the conversations that the two of them yeah. had yeah. together, right? And yet they're both a part of the 12, the, the, you know, the inner circle of Jesus's followers. So I think that's that's incredibly powerful that there is something that even right now in society, we're hearing about more and more this need for us to connect with people outside of our our, our regular circles, um, even as the world gr grows more and more pol polarized. And yet that's been present in the people mm. of God from the very beginning. Mm. That's what God wanted for his people. Um, so when we come to church, I loved what you said, when we come to church, there is no status, mm. right? We're all We're all equals and we all interact and we all worship in the same way. I see that a lot in our deacons ministry, actually. Um, you know, we, we don't call people by doctor or anything in deacons. We're just, we're just names, we're just deacons, right? And we serve along, you know, a doctor will serve alongside, a, a mechanic will mm. serve alongside someone who's a, a high school student, a college student. They will all serve along one side, one another. So what binds us together is our service and mm. not our status. And I think that's, that's so beautiful that we're yes. trying to create a context where people mm. are on an even playing field together. Oh, that's such a powerful principle and not only a principle but a practical example of how that's happening now i think we're both introverts actually most of the pastors say for some ex a few exceptions at least on this staff are introverts and so it's difficult to go out and step out of your comfort zone to, mm. to frame and forge these relationships you were talking a bit about the early church and, and it got me to thinking just about this wide strata and this this diversity that made up the early church. But what really strikes me, Joey, is it was incumbent on the quote unquote most well-to-do or most powerful members of that diverse society mm -hmm. to actually go out and be intentional with inviting people who they would have not connected with uh, in other ways. Paul's whole argument, right, yeah. about the Lord's Supper to the church in Corinth yeah. is exactly that. Yes. You guys are having two meals, one for your friends and your inner circle of people that you can share stuff with, mm -hmm. and then the other one for, for everyone. And that that is antithetical to the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. And so not only are we, are we blessed to serve in a congregational reality that says, hey, we all are serving alongside each other. Mm -hmm. what, what sets us apart and what binds us together is not our status, but our service. But then we are also having this rather uncomfortable call to go out and be intentional as people that have some sort of authority within this not within this church of family to find people who might be living on the margins. How do we get past though this this kind of inherent introvert nature that I know a lot of us yeah. and a lot of our friends out there might have? Yeah. Yeah, I think we introverts struggle with this um, more than others. Um, I think of one member of our staff who <laughs> can make friends with pretty much anybody. You, you know, walk on the street, he says hi, and he, he has a conversation and a prayer with them and they're friends afterwards. Yeah. And the rest of us are kind of in awe of, of his ability <laughs> to make that kind of connection. Um, and I'm sure those of you who are watching, if you know our staff at all, you could probably guess who they are, who we're, we're talking about. But yeah, that, that kind of ease in in creating relationships that that Pastor Philip has, 
is something that you know I, I I long for, but I know that that's not part of the makeup that God made for me. I do think part of it though comes from leaning in to the fact that it's going to be uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. It's going to be awkward. And it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable, and just say, you know, I, I understand that because. If it's not uncomfortable, that means it's easy, which probably means that it's someone, again, like we talked about, who's close to us and who is like us, right? So if the person is unlike us, there's going to be some level of discomfort. And yet we lean into it just like we do. We lean into other things that we know are good but are uncomfortable. Mm. We lean into it and say, despite the discomfort, this is worth it. It's worth it because this is what God has called us to be and to do. And honestly, some of my best, most unexpected friendships have come from leaning into a relationship with someone that I normally wouldn't be in a relationship with and who is so unlike me. And yet there's something beautiful that comes when you actually lean into that that kind of relationship. Yeah. Yeah, I was, as you were saying, and I bet our friends out there know that it's Pastor Phil. If you've ever seen Pastor Phil at work, he is a master at crafting relationships. Uh, For the rest of us, it's difficult. I know Linda um, is constantly telling me that I need more friends and that she she sends me now on these mandates, (laughs) which are terrible. Because she'll put two of us together, Joey, and she'll say, hey, here's John Doe. She sets you up. She sets me up with guys. <laughs> it's like a blind mandate it's or something. It's a blind <laughs> mandate. And she'll say, hey, you like baseball. John Doe likes baseball. Talk about baseball. And it is the most uncomfortable and awkward thing ever. And none of them have been successful. Yeah. So as you're talking about leaning into the discomfort, Um, I'm thinking maybe, and just maybe, it is to recognize that those people who live on the margins are are by and large invisible Mm. during the week. And what really moves me about Jesus's ministry isn't the wonderful preaching. It's not even the miracles. It's the fact that Jesus had this uncanny capacity to simply say, I see you. Mm. To the yes. woman that was a complete pariah and didn't feel even com- even worthy to, to talk to him and just g- grasps his robe, he turns around yeah. and makes a big deal precisely because he wants to punctuate the fact that I see you. Wow. And maybe that's how we lean into the discomfort. Maybe yeah. when we come to church on Sabbath, We are intentional about looking at people who, by and large, are invisible during the week and Mm -hmm. simply say, we see you. And even though you might not be important in our society or the way we value people in in this broken world that we have, in our church as a covenant community, we see you. Mm. Wow, that is so powerful. And it's so powerful that we see the people who are unseen. And, you know, if, if you've ever had someone listen to you, like really listen to you, you know mm-hmm. how valued that makes you feel, yeah. right? I, 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 I heard, I'm not sure where I heard this from, but that people actually don't care how interesting you are. They really care how interested mm-hmm. you are in them, mm-hmm. right? So when it comes to building these relationships, maybe the key is not so much trying to be interesting and trying to be this compelling person that the other person Mm -hmm. wants to like, but really just taking an interest in the other person. I remember hearing about an interviewer. They asked him, like, how are you so successful at interviewing? And his answer was that I just come into every conversation expecting to be amazed by the person that I'm talking to. And I often am. Oh my goodness. What if we approached our relationships that way? Just expecting that something amazing is going to come from that person. Because the reality is just by being children of God, being people that are formed by God, people are amazing people, Mm. right? And yet a lot of times we're so blinded by our own stuff that we don't take the time to really notice to Mm -hmm. see other people and that seems to be what jesus did he saw people yeah well that that makes us a covenantal community i you know i had and i'm sure you did too i had all these preconceptions about what loma linda university's pastoral staff was like Mm. 
Uh, years ago, they would play uh, on the radio the sermons and the services of this church. And so because there were two services driving to my di uh, four church district, I would always listen to what was going on in Loma Linda. And so years before I got here, um, I considered our senior pastor my pastor. And that's where I would go for inspiration and, and just to think about Scripture in new ways. And then I remember um, being in San Antonio with him. Uh, I was new on staff. Linda and I had just come on staff. And I was still a little bit in awe about this place. And we're, we're walking into San Antonio right during the general conference session. And nobody knows who I am. Everybody knows who Randy is. And so we sit down at a restaurant, Joey, and there's a line of people who are now forming wow. to get his autograph. And I know he's gonna be embarrassed in, please boss, don't fire me. <laughs> Uh, there's this line of people mm. and both him and Anita are asking Linda and I about the minutia mm. about our three-year-old Micah at that time. Mm -hmm. And that made us feel so special and so hurt and so valued. And if we were having any doubts, if, the, if this was the place to him, the care and the complete laser focus that we were shown at that meal um, just won us over. Mm -hmm. And just, just to reiterate what you're saying, I don't think... I don't think Randy said more than three words during that meal. I, he, he just listened. And by his listening, he made us feel extremely valued. Yeah, uh, you know, he has this way of making the person in front of him feel like the most important person, mm -hmm. right? And um, there are some people who are one type of person when they're on the platform or on the stage and a different type of person when they're not. But Randy is... He is the same. He's, I mean, for those of you that don't know him personally, he is the same person that he's on the platform. He's that same person uh, when he's yeah. off. And I, I just love that about him. I love that integrity and honesty, but I also love the fact that he genuinely cares about people. And I think you can sense that. You can sense his caring. And, and maybe that's, that's where we start when mm -hmm. we build these relationships. We, we start with, with the genuinely caring for the other so that and we're noticing them like like you talked about and and he's an introvert as well <laughs> um it's so true. he it, it's very uncomfortable for him to strike conversations and so i guess what i'm trying to say and what we're trying to say for you friends out there who are watching is you don't have to be extremely interesting or friendly or capable you simply have to care yeah and caring means listening and maybe some of you are asking, well, how do we listen better? And I'll tell you how, Joey, just, just as you're mentioning, people that are different when they're, when they're in the public eye and, and privately. I've known, and I'm sure you've known, uh, celebrities, both in and out of Adventism, mm -hmm. who are talking to you only until somebody better comes along. Comes <laughs> along. And so you can, you can sense that. You can yeah. sense that they're talking to you. But they're constantly scanning to yes. find somebody better. Yes. And that's not how we make the seen, the unseen visible, particularly mm -hmm. during Sabbath. Yeah. During Sabbath, our job is to talk to people mm -hmm. as if, like you said, they're the most important being in the room because they're the most important person for God. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's what Isaiah is pointing us to. Mm -hmm. That is how we refrain our foot from breaking the Sabbath and we do not do what delights us. What the, You were talking about discomfort. Mm -hmm. Well, what delights me is staying in my comfort zone, yeah. talking to people with whom I have a rapport. But maybe what Isaiah is trying to talk about is saying, look, on this day, we want to we wanna create heaven on earth. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, there are some people in circumstances yeah that really need that break because their life during those six days is just so difficult. Yeah. So can you be intentional about leaning, as we're talking about, about leaning into that discomfort a bit? 
Yeah, and that passage, Isaiah 58, like you were talking about, and how we've we've mentioned this before, that Isaiah 58 actually begins with this idea that the reason why God is not accepting their acts of worship, mm-hmm. their fasting and all of that is because they are also oppressing mm-hmm. these people who are marginalized, That's who right. we don't notice, That's right. right? And so actually, really, when it, when it concludes, it's really saying, see these people, care for these people, and that's how you keep my mm. Sabbath, right? That's how you refrain from, from breaking my Sabbath. And for that to happen, really, we have to, we have to create some limits. Yeah. You know, like you talked about, the only way that I pay attention to the person in front of me is if I actually create a limit and say, I'm not going to be looking around for somebody else mm-hmm. to pay attention to. I say no to all of these other things to say yes to this person, right? We have, you, limits sometimes have gotten a bad rap. Mm-hmm. We think, like we talked about last week, that freedom comes from being unlimited. But what we said last week was that freedom actually comes from creating appropriate limits. And the same, I think, is true about the Sabbath. The Sabbath becomes a blessing day, a day that we can focus on relationships if we say no to other things that mm-hmm. get in the way yeah. of relationships, mm-hmm. whether it's our cell phones, whether if it's our jobs, what, whatever it is, when we say no to those things, it creates space for us to say yes to relationships. Mm. And so I think those, those limits are a key part of creating an environment where we can actually focus on a relationship with God and focus on a relationship with other oh, people. That's, that's so well stated. And, and you know what's heartbreaking, Joey, is that the secular world has understood this for about a hundred years, right? Uh, during the New Deal, FDR was saying, "Hey, you want to measure how successful we are as a society? Don't look at the top one percent. Mm-hmm. We've got to create a safety net for the people who are at the bottom rung of society, so that we pull them up. Mm-hmm. And if we can pull them up, that's our metric. That's our measurable metric about how successful and caring." and covenantal we are as a people. And I think the reason why this term of covenant is used communally and not individually is because God is inviting us to recognize the reality that, hey, if you want to be a chosen people, if you want to be a priestly priestly kingdom, if you want to be a holy nation, then you need to begin by looking at the margins. Mm -hmm. And you don't try and import Jesus from the center to the margins because Jesus was birthed on the margins. And so his experience from the margins is what ought to inform everything we do. The book itself was written for a people on the margins. (laughs) And so we can't then just simply say, well, we're gonna export a little bit of faith from the center to the margins. Mm -hmm. We need to always begin from the margins. And yes, it's it's, it's uncomfortable, but I think you're absolutely right in stating that the only way that it happens is if we're intentional in creating limits. Yeah, I mean, the, just the idea of a remnant people are really, by definition, people on the margins, right? right? They're the ones that are left <laughs> over, right? And so, of course, you know, whether or not we agree with FDR's policies, the principles that undergird those policies, that the vision of caring for those on the margins, that's 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 key, and that is at the heart of the Christian me- message, right. right? And so, and it's woven throughout the prophets. And so in order for that to happen, we have to say no to some other things. Some other things that at the moment we may be addicted to, Mm -hmm. at the moment that we may want to say yes to, but saying at least on on the Sabbath. I mean, hopefully it'll overflow into the other days of the week, right? But at least on the Sabbath, that should be a day that we say yes to relationships with God, with each other, with people on the margins, Mm. with people who are different from us, people who are unseen. That's that's Sabbath. Yeah. And and I think as you as you were saying, the the idea itself of remnant mm. is an idea of a people who dwell on the margins. Mm. Revelation itself, right, is crafted mm. for a people that will live on the edges. And so if we're talking about the Sabbath kind of a sign as the remnant, mm. I think what we're trying to share with our friends out there is not that the Sabbath is simply the day on which you go to church, but rather that the sign of the Sabbath as covenant Mm -hmm. is it's the day we recognize 
and we invest in those who live on the outskirts. Amen. Joey, thank you so much. I think uh, you've, we've talked about a lot of stuff and we've talked about the Sabbath in a new way. And my prayer for, for you out there who are watching is that today you say no to something in order to say yes to people. Joey, would you close us out in prayer? Yes. Let's bow our hands. Gracious God, loving God, the God of the Sabbath, you gave this to us um, to remind us that we are not beasts of burden. We are not just created to produce, but we are created to be in relationship, relationship with you and with each other. And so we ask that the principle of the Sabbath, especially on the Sabbath, but also on the other days of our week, overflows to relationships that we are able to engage with, with people who are like us, people who are unlike us, people on the margins of society, that we would create the space, the limits that give us the opportunity to connect is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May Yahweh shine his light upon you this Sabbath and for all eternity. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.